sorry. <laughs> Am I supposed to stand behind the podium? You can do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. It works. It kind of works. Do you know whose weed this is back here? Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Matt Wagner. I am the uh, owner of Hellion Gallery here in Old Town. I also have a couple books out. And uh, I do the mural festival here in town. I do art direction for Gigantic Brewing. Uh, juggle a bunch of different random things and uh, I'm here at the Curiosity Club to talk about uh, economics with artists and what's going on in the city. So my gallery is right around the corner here just on 5th and Cooch and this is the current show I have up right now and these are all artists that are featured in my uh, new book Tall Trees of Portland which is a ton of artists from Portland and uh, it follows up my second book, which was Tall Trees of, or my first book, which was Tall Trees of Tokyo. And, which was this book right here. And I basically uh, brought a bunch of uh, Japanese artists, uh, had them fill out these questionnaires, like this one, and talk about their neighborhood and talk about their lives, which is like sort of a precursor before it goes into their portfolio. And, Kind of the reason I did this is, is it's the philosophy of my gallery is I'm trying to make sure artists get paid. Basically, you know, they, in general, it's like really common for you know, is this artists get screwed all the time. You know, it's this whole thing where you know, they'll do a ton of work and someone will be like, hey, I'll give you a case of beer. Um, this is some of his work. He does everything out of wood. It's all carved and uh, uh, painted wood. And basically with a guy like this, I think a lot of people don't realize is he has kids, he has a house, he has all these things going on. And so my whole thing is trying to make sure that he gets paid properly. And I know most galleries, that is, that's every gallery is like this. Every gallery is like trying to sell art and make money for him. But I think what happens is everybody's so into the hype, you know, that they actually don't often you know, really focus on making sure that the artist gets paid well for how much time they put in. These things take, this piece is in my gallery right now, and I mean, this piece probably took him close to a month to make. And if you think about how much he's selling it for, I mean, you know, a month of like, of basically 15 hour days and like your final payoff is maybe like $2,000. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty strenuous work for not a lot of money, actually. And then these all have to be shipped to different locations. So this is the piece we're sending to Tokyo, or it was already sent to Tokyo uh, last year. So I gave this piece to 12 different artists in Tokyo to uh, customize and take apart and do whatever they wanted to do. And it's kind of a risk because basically, you know, over there, Artists over there are less inclined to make cool shit, basically. They're trying to actually be a little bit more conceptual. So they're not looking at this and thinking, oh, I'm going to make this better. They're thinking, I'm going to make this a little different. So like this is the artist Yoshi47. As soon as he got it, he dismantled it. He took it completely apart. Um, and he even there's all this glue and stuff on these scales. And he scraped off all the glue and everything. And then in the end, what he did was customize each individual piece for the sculpture. And when I sent this to AJ, AJ was like, oh, this thing's going to be so awesome. He's going to reassemble it, and it's going to have all these things, you know, these customized painting on it. But you really can't predict, you know. So actually what he did was this. <laughs> he ended up making basically an American meal and a Japanese meal out of it. So you have your pork main course. And then you have your really beautiful Japanese meal over there to the right. 
Uh, I think there was about 30, at least 30 seconds after I told AJ and showed him these pictures where the air all got sucked out of the room. And I was like, it's going to be awesome. Um, there's a little detail from that. But basically, it shows how great of an artist he is because he's willing, these pieces, you know, he's willing to basically take the risk, you know, and let people, you know, screw them up or make them look better. It depends. I personally like this. I think it's awesome. I mean, I, I, I couldn't sell this thing to save my life, but it's going to be really awesome in the gallery and it's going to look cool. Um, I'm going to have a world premiere film here in a second on this next slide. So basically, that is one of his pieces being burned up by one of the artists in Tokyo. Um, <laughs> this also was a fun day yesterday. <laughs> um, and the best part is, is after the artist did it, uh, I'm kind of curious, like, what happened in the end? Like, you know, what was uh, what more interesting, which is letting these strangers, he, he hasn't met any of these artists, you know, these are all complete strangers to him. When he gets there this weekend, going to go around and introduce him to him, and that'll be the first time that they have ever met him. Um, they only know him through his artwork. So it should be pretty interesting, but at the same time, it's like, it's a challenge. So this is the second artist uh, from my book. This is Salazar. I'm showing a bunch of stuff from my book just because they're kind of nice visuals. <laughs> but um, he makes a bunch of stuff out of everything. Junk, I don't know if you're familiar with him. This is kind of his painting style. This is his questionnaire. Um, really readable, clear, um, but uh, he does love the St. John's Bridge. Um, and then this is Josh Keyes, who's also a local artist, um, who a lot of people don't realize is uh, local. You can kind of see the difference between the workspaces between these artists. One is like super clean and neat, and the other one is pretty crazy with stuff. Uh, this is Josh um, and his questionnaire, and also how neatly he wrote. And I think that's the other thing with the book is it's really like shining a light on the differences between these artists, like in multiple levels. Like they're all on the same level, I think, creatively, but then. You look at how they answer the questions and how they write, and it's, it's pretty interesting. That's some of Josh's work. This is another image from the book. This is Blaine Fontana, another artist I've worked with for a long, long time. Um, he does uh, art for a publishing company down in Los Angeles called Zero Plus, and that's, he's a split brain artist. So he's one of these artists that I feel is able to balance the line fine art and basically doing commercial work. So he can make like paintings and gallery shows, but then at the same time, he's probably got like easily 10 books under his belt as a uh, art director for a publishing house. And he is able to split it in between each time, you know, and his style for graphic design and his style for art are pretty radically different, actually. So it's kind of, uh, he's a rare case. This is uh, Stephanie Buer. She is a oil painter from Portland. Jen Lobo, another oil painter from Portland. These are all images from the book. Oh. Joe Shea, another artist from Portland, sculptor, uses found objects. Um, Pete Gronquist, another artist. He has a big piece in my gallery right now. Um, so the whole concept for the books are basically to kind of let people know about Portland and let people know that we are sort of like, we're on the map for sure. I mean, these artists are like known worldwide. And I think people come up to me all the time and they're like, why is Josh Keyes in your book? He's not from Portland. And I'm like, well, actually he is from Portland or even Pete. I've had two people in the past week come and see the sculpture that's in my gallery right now and be like, why did he, did he ship this here from New York? And I'm like, he doesn't live in New York. You know, and it's this thing where I think locals really feel like sometimes like some of these artists, like they're on this different level, but these guys are all local. And these are just some images from the mural fest. And this is another project where I bring in artists from other, can be up high on a lift. <laughs> and this is in, uh, this is Enrico. He's a Japanese artist uh, and he was doing the Clyde Drexler piece over there. 
he was not as casual about that. He was very afraid of that lift, as I recall. I sort of was, too, because I'm the one who put this wood under there. And I thought, man, I hope our liability insurance covers this guy dying when these boards don't work. But this is mock. That's so Yeah, it's like... Uh, the funny thing is, is, you know, they have those little safety bars around them, you know, so you're not supposed to do that in this whole thing, this, like, clip thing. And he just would take it off and split it. And you can't see from this, he always had a cigarette in his mouth. And so he's, like, smoking and drinking iced coffee and painting, like, straddling the roof and the lift, you know. And well, the guy over at the Jolly Rogers was actually standing up on the upper bar. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it, gets, it gets a little, yeah. Actually, the first day... I, it was a futile attempt. They, all, they gave safety harnesses. You've seen them, I'm sure, like these things that, like, you know, it's like if you're repelling or something. And so the first guy, Enrico, this really tall, lanky Japanese guy, who's the first guy I had to demonstrate how to put this safety thing on. And I didn't even know how to do it, you know? And so I'm just, like, just guessing. And you were able to unclip it, right, so that it could go on easily. But I didn't, so it was like a onesie. And so this really guy, I'm making him put his legs through, and at one point it's around here and it's around his neck, and he just falls down. And then at that point we were kind of like, yeah, you know, I mean, if, if you feel unsafe, you should figure out how to wear this. Um, but if not, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, that, I think the thing about, I think the common thread here is, is I'm trying to like, I'm trying to like make it just one level playing field between other countries and us. Basically, bringing in foreign artists to work with local artists, um, and bringing taking local artists over to different countries like Tokyo, and eventually here in the next year, I'm going to be doing some shows in France, and having the Portland artists work with locals on the ground because I mean there is sort of this like I don't know what you call it. I guess hype about Portland now. People really like us suddenly. You know, I don't know where they were like 17 years ago when like the guy was coming out of the park with like the drunk naked lady in his shopping cart. But now suddenly everybody really, really loves us, you know, and they're trying to like, they're trying to capitalize on it. And I feel like I kind of want to use that a little bit to help all these local uh, artists like kind of get a leg up on the community. Um, so that's kind of... That's kind of like what I, well, that's kind of the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions? I know it was kind of short and sweet. Please. Did he create a different piece for each? No, so it's, he replicated the same piece, which he had never done before, um, just to see if he could do it, which if you're making an individual piece of art, that's pretty, that's pretty crazy, actually, to try to replicate it, and he did. Um, he actually did it 15 times. So did he just do pattern work and then follow? Yeah, he basically he, he put the whole thing in a, like a CAD program, for lack of a better word. I looked over his shoulder, and I was like, is this what they call CAD? And he's like, yeah, I guess. I mean, we're not, none of us are. So I'm like, oh, I see. Think, but then for me, I thought it was more of like a uh, Temple of the Golden Pavilion, uh, more of like this reference to burning beauty in Buddhism, which uh, was like a thing that happened in the 50s in Japan where a, a young, uh, teenage acolyte at a Buddhist temple burnt down the Golden Pavilion because it was like too pretty and like he felt like it shouldn't be for other people to look at basically. So I said, I'm going to say that instead of Viva Jimi Hendrix. But, you know, <laughs> uh, any other? Yeah. So where does your interest come in Japanese culture and Japanese art? Because it sounds like it's been a long time. Yeah, so I... Uh, Probably, I don't know, maybe 13 years ago, um, I have family that live in Japan, and I went to visit them, and uh, I actually didn't want to go. Um, I was just like, kind of felt I had to go visit family, and so I went, and then it just changed my life. I mean, just after I got there, I was like, holy, this is like such an awesome country. It just like... I fell in love with it, and then at that point, I was like, this is the most expensive trip I've ever taken, so then I have to figure out now how to make these, like, job-related, and so after that, it was every step was trying to make it job-related, and then over the time, you make tons of friends, and so, um, you know, that's kind of the... That's kind of the thing. And so these book that's even the first book. The first book is sort of a love letter to this like group of Japanese artists I met for the first 10 years I was doing shows 
Japan. Um, just because no one knows them, you know, they don't, they don't really get to show outside of Japan and none of them are famous. They're all just like working class artists and trying to get by. Um, and so that's sort of where that came from. And so it just keeps, I don't really feel, someone was just before the thing was asking me about that and I, uh, I don't feel like there's a real difference. Like when I go there, I don't feel any difference than when I'm here. You know, it's like as soon as I get off the plane, you know, my phone rings with like some and then I go to the gallery and I work at a gallery and I hang a show and there's really, other than the language and fantastically better food, it's not that much different, you know, but it's, oh, did I, did I hurt somebody with the food comment? Come on, man, Okonomiyaki, <sighs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it, sure. They were permission walls. Have you worked with the city of Portland or any of you guys stuff trying to get offers just, you know, require and how into people aren't expecting to see it? Well, it, I mean, I, I think these are pretty, like, off the grid. So, I mean, the way it works is uh, I, there's this common misconception that in Portland murals are illegal or that painting, like, walls is illegal because of this whole thing that happened with uh, Clear Channel, like, I can't remember, it was maybe 10 years ago. I think, I think that's when it happened. Um, and actually, most of the rules have been changed in the past two years. It's actually quite simple. You just have to get permission from the building owner or whoever the tenant is and get a permit. And the permit, the only reason they have the permit is so that they want to have it registered so it's not advertising. So you can't advertise. Like, you can't get this permit. I couldn't have had them paint like a, like a Nike swoosh or something on there. You know, that would have been against the rules. But personally for me, I don't want to see any bullshit advertising. You know, I, I want to see the art, you know. So I've heard about a couple other people doing uh, mural projects here in town and like one day events. So, you know, I mean, I mean, it's me. I'm a, I'm a curator. So, you know, I know some people look at a building and they like how the building looks. Me, I think that every wall should be covered with some something interesting, you know, so. Right. They invited artists to come from all over the world. Yeah. Do that stuff. Is that we don't do an open call because, I mean, uh, well, to be honest, it's because this is like I'm, I'm a curator. So I'm pretty hardcore about making sure that, like, what I show and who I show with is something in my. It's selfish. It's straight up selfish. I mean, these are artists I like. These are, you know, and that's, that's why I say other people should do it. Because if you don't like what we're doing, then you should do it yourself and do it with other walls. And that would be awesome because then you'd get this really great, like, mix of different kind of styles. Like, me, I'm not, actually a, uh, I'm not actually a fan of traditional, like, graffiti walls. I actually like a little bit more contemporary abstract or even narrative walls. So, but that's just me. And that's how we did it. And so I picked artists that I felt fit that. Um, and then we kind of want to make it even with, like, even an even number of Portland artists and an even number of out-of-town uh, artists. Um, but, I mean, hopefully these will all start up and maybe they will do an open call, you know? I mean, that would be, I mean, that would be kind of cool. If that, I mean, you should do that. You should, like, do an open call competition. That's a cool idea, you know? Say you're going to do it for a week and just have everybody submit and have a pan people, like, judge. And, you know, and if you get in, you get in. Um, that would be pretty cool. No, no, I don't. It's really weird. Like, I, 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 my tastes are all over the place. And I think that's usually sort of the kiss of death for most galleries, you know. But, you know, eclectic is such a terrible word, but it's pretty accurate. You know, it's like I, there's some contemporary art I love. There's some narrative stuff. There's some illustration stuff, uh, like lowbrow, like pop surrealism. I like all that, you know. And so... Basically, with me, it's all about the art. The artist. I mean, it's really bad, actually. It's like for me, I don't work with an artist unless I have gotten to know them. 
If I find an artist I want to work with, we communicate over the phone, we communicate over email. At some point, I usually try to travel to where they are to like go to their studio and see what they're doing. I try to actually sell their pieces before the show, like find customers for them beforehand. So by the time the show happens, they're like my friends. You know, it's not, it's not like a stranger, you know. I could never do that. Then it's like the same thing as if I worked at McDonald's selling Big Macs. You know, it's like you kind of got to know these people. You got to know. And so I think actually I sell the artist foremost. And then sort of the art comes second, actually. Um, but usually those are the people, their person that, like, I don't know what it is. Like, I, I don't, I've never had a problem with, like, disliking a, a great artist. I don't show art I don't like. I don't show people I don't like. Even if you're a great artist and you're a total asshole, I'm not going to show you. You know, even if it's going to make me money, because I just don't need that kind of bull. Put their name really big on the back of the project, and I'm like, well, you know, that big name is not going to pay their rent. So, you know, and I think now that means most of the people that come to me to ask for commercial artists are people who know my first and foremost is going to be like, how much are you paying? And I, that may sound like really kind of weird for me to break it down like that, but that is the way I look at it. You know, I, I don't have a problem for artists advertising with uh, doing products or any of that. I mean, unless it's some stupid product that's like screwing up our world. But, you know, it's like, you know, if it's like a company that's like honest and making an honest product, then they should be happy with it. And those people always pay the most. I mean, that's the thing is, I do art direction for gigantic brewing here in town. They're one of the smaller breweries, great product. I would say, hands down, they treat the artists that I pick for their labels better than any other brewery in this city. I mean, there's respect. You know, there's respect. They're doing, they're giving them a really good product to help sell their product. And their product happens to be a locally made, not bullshit product. Um, so I do that. And then on top of that, I just do a lot of marketing. So basically, you know, if, if someone has an inventory piece, I have a customer for it. I have some, I've developed a pretty good network now where someone can say, hey, you know, I can't pay my rent, but I have these two extra pieces. I know someone I can sell that to. So I don't know what you call that. I mean, I don't know what that kind of person is called, but I, yeah, basically, basically. And then, uh, uh, you know, and I find someone to buy their work to like, you know, for the need or whatever, so. So this is a tough one because uh, we we pay for uh, we pay for everything, but this is a nonprofit, so we can't pay for that. But we pay for everything else. They get their airfare covered, housing, food, um, and then what I do, like with this guy, just what I'm saying. He, after he finished his mural, I got him a job painting another at a, another mural, but it was a mural for hire. So. At the end of this, he did a two-day job, and he made $2,000 to paint you know, a small mural for this local company. And we did that for all these guys. If you have a person, I mean, it's like, I come from like a music background. And I remember whenever you would tour, you had to figure out all these ways to make money inside and out without selling drugs. And so you, would, you, you had to figure out all these ins and outs, right? So I think with these guys, the ins and outs is if you have a guy coming from Australia for Japan, we've already paid to get him here. He's already here. He's already doing something. You should take advantage as a lo of a local business because you're going to get to utilize something that is not in the current pond, actually. So for him, he got that. Same thing with Megs. Megs, the guy, uh, we got him a job where he got paid, and the guy wanted him to stay in town another week to paint. So he stayed here next week, got paid to paint another thing, got it, and the guy even paid for his plane ticket to fly back to uh, San Francisco after that. And so on this one, it's nonprofit. So really, we, it, the whole point is we can't pay them. But technically, I find them other work to make money. But they don't lose money. Um, I mean, we're trying not to make, lose money. My partner and I, we lost a shit ton of money. Because, you know, I don't know if you know, these things are really expensive. And it's like, and then you call them, and you're like, let's say one wall's done, and you have a wall a mile away, and you're like, could you come move this? And they're like, we can come move this for a mere $275. So this lift drove illegally on the streets of Portland several times. It go we didn't have any support at all. We didn't have any financial support. We raised money by people giving products that we sold, and then uh, we would find money here. This year, we're a little smarter. We're actually going to launch a... Uh, like a Kickstarter, Indiegogo thing, so that, I mean, it's not, a, I, I don't think it's a lot of money. To bring in 20 guys and have them paint, you know, 10 or 15 murals in town for one week, I mean, 
it's about $17,000. I don't, I don't really think that's a lot of money, um, but I'm obviously rich. So, um, but, so that's our goal this year. Um, but yeah, so the answer your long way around to answer that question, but yes, we find other work for them to give them money. Yeah. So you're a curator, you're an agency, you're a marketer. Sort of. In an art career. Yeah. How did you get started? You know, I went to art school. You know, it's like, I'm a big, I'm a big, I, you know, everybody's so down on going to school or going to art school because the money, education is good, period. I don't give a shit how much it costs. Education is good. And I didn't do, use my degree at all. I played in bands. I have a, I have a BFA from Indiana University. I did sculpture. And all I did was sit around in a van and drive around the country and play in bands. And I kept thinking, man, I went to school for this. For, for, for four years, and I'm just like sleeping next to this dude who smells so bad. And, you know, and then finally one day I come to Portland and I was like, there's a niche here. There's a niche. There's like, you know, I feel like there needs to be a concise, you know, curation. You can't just always have your friends in shows. You can't just always have like sort of half ass shows. If you like raise the level up and you make everybody professional, then we're going to get more respect. And so I feel like that's how it all started. And then I realized curator, art director, you know, art pimp, uh, these are all things that are, that like go together really well. And now the books, the books are, for me, are awesome because I, I remember the first time I recorded a, an album and it got, you know, put out as a seven inch. And I was like, holy shit, I've made it, even though I couldn't even afford to buy groceries, you know, but I was so happy. And now the book is like my, my adult life version of that. Like I sort of look at the book and like, you know, cradle it, you know, because no one really seems to be, we're not a book culture anymore. <laughs> we're sort of a TV culture. And so I like the fact that there's this thing that's going to be forever documenting all of these artists that like whatever they do, you know, however, whatever direction they go, this is a permanent document of what they do. And so I guess it goes art director into author or whatever. Um, I don't care. I mean, you know, I mean, I hopefully after I get back from Jan Japan, I'm going to have like a whole like line of kitchen knives called Hellion Blades, you know, and then I can just retire. <laughs> but. Any other questions? Yeah. So when you do the murals, do you tag the mural with the mural art project or something? No. No. They, I mean, one up on Northeast, the artist chose to write, it's called Forest for the Trees, is what we call the mural project. And they chose to write uh, FFT whatever on there, like a hashtag. It's always awesome to see a hashtag thing on a mural. I'm like, <laughs> we're ridiculous. But, um, and so everything else, we didn't really advertise it. Uh, the artist with the hashtag in front of it. <laughs> and so it's like a hashtag mad steez. Um, and then the other artist signed under it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we should sign them. I mean, this year we're going to have a map, like a map done before. I mean, really any detriment to this last year was literally our lack of, it's the first time and we just did it by the seat of our pants. I mean, we didn't have any money. We were just like, let's do it because no one else is doing it. And I think that's how things start. You know, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if I'll continue doing this because, you know, I get, I'm getting more and more busy and I don't know what will happen. So hopefully someone will take up the reins and continue this kind of thing. I mean, that's why we did it. It's not like some proprietary thing where we registered trademarks or some nonsense. So, um, yeah. So do you do, uh, when you talk about taking care of your artists and mm -hmm. artists' rights and that, do you help educate your artists? Yes. That's the most important, that's actually the most important part, I would say, is like sometimes I think artists don't, are their worst enemy for sure. Because they, they don't, they, they, a lot of times they don't, they, they accidentally sell themselves short. So they underprice things or they over, you know, like they overpromise things that they can't actually deliver. Um, or they are just so eager to do work that they'll just flood the market. Um, I just had a talk with one of the artists I work with who's in the book, and she suddenly realized that, like, right now she's got like 20 paintings in inventory all on the West Coast, you know? 
and there was stuff selling before that, and then suddenly they're not selling as well, and that's probably why. I mean, you got to control your inventory just like anything else. You, you know, these things, it makes, it makes it seem like she's cranking these things out like every day, but she's not. Her paintings take like over a month. They're like amazing, but she took on too many jobs, and so she had to just work nonstop to deliver, but now she's in a position where way too much stock, way too much stuff out there. So, I mean, that's just part of it. You try to educate people like that. You try to educate people not to work with, like, bad companies. I mean, it's hard when you're poor. I mean, every, I'm guessing everybody here can, like, relate to being poor. If someone comes to you and says, oh, we're going to give you $400 to paint a refrigerator, even though it's for this company that, you know, doesn't give a shit about art, you know, and probably is making a product that's not good for the environment, 50% of the artists are going to be like, 400 bucks, man, that's, like, half my rent you know, and they're going to do it. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that they made the bad decision, but I feel like if you can just hold out and, like, make smarter decisions, you'll stop getting offered those, and you'll start getting offered much higher quality jobs. Because once you do a job like that, then that's hung around your neck. You know, that's, that's what you're known as, that guy. You know, and so you kind of got to be a little bit careful about choices you make. And so hopefully... You know, and that's, I'm not saying 100% I'm right. This is strictly my opinion. Just like curation is subjective, it's my opinion. And so that's how I work it. You know, I don't want, I, I really hope the people I work with don't make mistakes, you know, like that. Hopefully. Yeah, but you have to make mistakes to learn. But, yeah, yeah. But I, I read something one time where it said that the best person in a field wasn't necessarily the best in the field. They were the best at percent or the best at bringing it forward. Oh, of so, course. Uh, I would never like I would never claim to be a good businessman I can't I mean you know I mean there's months where like I'm so strung out everywhere like you know with money out there that I'm like yeah, I can't believe I do this but it's the love of the art that makes me do it you know and so I feel like I could be a better businessman I could probably do a better job for my artists if I did educate myself but the problem is is I do everything in an organic way and it's sort of seat of my pants and so sometimes I burn bridges, sometimes I build them, you know, and it's just kind of the way it goes. I feel like, but I got a comment and a question, but I feel like sometimes, especially with art, it's you also have to stand out. And so if you fall too far and go to a really straightforward business model, which I'm saying, you end up being one of many, you know, which is yeah. kind of the... Yeah. Um, I don't, God, that's a good question. I don't think I have, like, like performance art or that yeah, kind of thing. I, I haven't, but then that all kind of goes back to the selfishness of it. It's yeah. like, you know, for me, it's like, my porn is this. I like sculpture, I like this kind of stuff. So that's, that's what I'm into. If I was into that, for sure. Um, I do like installations a lot. Which installations are zero money yeah. for the audience. It's like, I mean, not entertainment. It's supposed to be a little bit thought provoking. And currently right now I'm looking for a space, another space to rent just to do installations. Um, that's awesome. That's an awesome discussion with my wife. I want to rent 3000 feet that I won't make any money off of. <laughs> you know, it's like, and she's kind of like, what? what? And I'm like, it's going to be awesome. So that's currently what I'm looking for right now because I love installations. I've had several in my gallery over the past year. And every time I see the artists work there, it's like their happy place. I just had one like a couple months ago with Souther Salazar. I'm going to be doing some stuff uh, later on this year with the music festival, like stuff like that. And I love that stuff. Strictly about immersion, you know, and, and it's, about, it's about the art 100%. There's Really nothing for sale, you know. Um, now, granted, you know, there'll have to be some sales. I mean, that's the curse of this job. I have to sell art. Luckily, I'm, I'm okay at it, you know, because then it's able to fund these other things that I'm going to hemorrhage money like I've just been stabbed. So, any other questions? Um, I just had a question about a term that you use, um, narrative, narrative. Excuse me, sir, you work here. I don't think you can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, I think I think narrative pieces are you know it could be like like that. Clyde Drexler going for a dunk. That's a narrative piece. Right. You know, it's like there's there's a story there. You know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean what the artist meant or whatever, but you know, there is. That's you know, I like that kind of stuff. I like it when I can make up the old story in my head. It's almost usually better than what the artist intended. But <laughs> any other questions? All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Ask some questions. Feel free to look through the book. Hi. Hams. <laughs>